Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 500 games. We are continuing on now with number 393 and this is another N64 game that I never had. Uh, it's GoldenEye 007 and this is a game that I know is highly regarded by many but for me it was okay and I remember this was a game that I played at the childcare centre that I mentioned at earlier and it was also a game I played at Nick's house I mentioned Nick before, he was someone who my mum used to child mind. And I mostly remember just messing about with the cheats more than anything else. I think that's just what most people did in general, as opposed to, you know, randomly playing the game properly on the single player, I suppose. I don't know. I think I may have played some of the single player just naturally without cheats, but I'm sure most of the time was played just messing around playing on the multiplayer with random cheats on and I think that because it was one of these new multiplayer first person shooter games I think for me what I liked about it was the idea that you could go places and then hide from people so they didn't know where you were I'm not talking about camping if that's what anyone's thinking about I don't mean camping I just mean the ability just the ability to be somewhere and for you to find other people and I know it's kind of strange to say that because you got it's a split screen so obviously you can just look on someone else's screen which you probably could do anyway and people call that cheating which I think is strange like how could you possibly be caught out for that I don't know but I didn't get an interest in the f competitive first person shooter genre that came from this and I just I don't know I, it never, it wasn't something that ever advanced with me, but I did have some fun with this game. Number 392 is Super Frog HD. Now this is an Amiga game that I didn't have on the Amiga. I actually played this on the PS3 and it's just a bare basic platform game where you play as a frog and you've got to jump around and collect things. And which I realise I'm talking so generically here jumping around having to collect things, that's really not much of a descriptor, is it? But it was a 2D platformer, and you can do really high jumps, and I do remember that one of the things about this game was the fact that there wasn't really any sense of acceleration. You kind of just ran, and then when you stopped, it was kind of sudden, you didn't have that flow to it. Which, to be honest, the, I do like the whole sense of flow and everything, but I'm not one to complain if a game doesn't have that. To me, this game was perfectly fine. I didn't really have any issues with it. Number 391 was Chime Super Deluxe, which was originally on the Xbox 360, but it did later come out on the PS3, if I'm not mistaken, that is. I may be mistaken there. But it's kind of like one of those, I suppose I would call it a puzzle action game. You've sort of got these jigsaw pieces to put into this grid and you have to line them up so that they make like f full solid squares or rectangles and this bar would come along and count points for you and it would eventually get rid of them so you had to add more parts onto it so that it would extend so that you could get more points out of it i don't really have any nostalgia or anything like that associated with this game so again because it was so recent and i didn't play it too much so i really can't expand on what I've said there. So I'll just move on to number 390, which is, and I don't know how you pronounce this. I'm just going to call it Goblins. It's it's spelt with three I's, so it might mean Goblins 3, but it looks like it says Goblins, so I'm just going to say Goblins. And this was one of those point and click adventure games, sort of, on the Amiga, but it wasn't so much a story point and click adventure where you go around and talk to people and and learn what to do and people tell you stories and all that. Rather it was you had three characters and each of them had their own ability. You had the one character that could punch things, you had the one character that could pick up items and use the items, and you had another character that had magical powers that like cast this magic spell on things. So the idea of the game was to look around the level and find ways of, of progressing through the different areas in the game. And 
some of them you wouldn't necessarily think about because it's not so intuitive. Like, for example, you wouldn't think to yourself that a magic spell is going to do a particular thing because magic is magic. There's no real logic to it. It just does its thing. So th there was that issue with it. But I did have some fun with this game. And I do specifically remember, for some reason, it, th the thing that sticks out in my mind is that there's like this house that you go into where there's this wizard reading a book and you have to sort of get your characters, the goblins I suppose, to go around and like go on the table for some reason and to like pick things up and all that. There were these Venus fly traps that would bite at you and stuff and sometimes you had to get this thing with like a fly in and it would fly up and the and the fly trap would, would eat it so you could sneak around whilst it, whilst it was busy eating stuff. It was a strange game for sure and I think it was one of those games whereby you could do something wrong that you wouldn't know is wrong but you just did a thing and it turned out to be the wrong thing which if you know what I mean like like for example there's two treasure chests and one of them contains a trap which eats you something like that not that particularly but things like that i also remember that this game had like an opening intro cinematic type of thing like an introductory story where there was a king sat at this table and it showed you had like this little bubble where it showed you someone playing with a voodoo doll of the king who was just messing about with it poking it with like a needle and using a feather to tickle it and this the king would start like screaming and laughing and stuff it was quite creepy to be honest number 389 is another flash game called turbo kids this on this game you control a kid in a race you're running from left to right and basically you don't control the movement you just control the jumping and the shooting of the fireballs and what happens is you are running and you have to know to jump at the right time so you can get across the holes. So basically like an endless runner. And you also shoot the snowball so you can hit your opponents to slow them down. And that's how you win the race. And you can also find these little power-ups that will boost you forward or make you jump up higher. And so everything was timing based. But you also, in this process, you collected coins. And with these coins you could buy upgrades that would allow you to carry more snowballs for example and that type of stuff that you know like extra powers that type of stuff and the idea was the ultimate goal was to get first first place on each of the races the next game on the list is number 388 which is the lost world jurassic park on the playstation i don't think i got too far on this to be honest because i seem to remember finding cheat codes and pulling them in to see what the later levels were like and you would play as different creatures like different dinosaurs and i remember there was one level where you played as a human but i don't really remember much about that but i remember the first level in particular i remember it was one of those games whereby at the start if you moved backwards there was a hidden life there but also i remember when you killed enemies you could eat them to regain your health and also it had that 2.5D element to it whereby you would move left and right and the levels would be set out in a left to right format but sometimes the graphics would make you go in and out based on like cliffs and just the way that the path was moulded and all that and I had quite a bit of fun with this game but it's quite hard to remember quite a lot of the details. Go on to the next game which I do remember a lot more details of. Number 387 is the Blues Brothers on the Amiga. Now, this, with it being an Amiga game, it was one of my very, very early games. And I've never seen the Blues Brothers. I don't know what it's about. Uh, I, I don't know anything. All I know is that there's two brothers. I know what they look like. I know how some of the songs go. Not necessarily off the top of my head, but I know some of the songs go. And that's it, really. I know it's something to do with music, which is where the name yeah, the Blues Brothers would have come from. But I don't really know much about you know, the film or what the story is behind it. But I remember you choose between one of the, the two brothers and it's basically this platform game. But there are specific things I remember about it, such as the way that you killed enemies was that you threw these crates at them. But crates were a limited resource because you could find them lying around in the level. And 
you picked them up and when you threw them, they just went straight forward and the crates would disappear forever. And enemies just ran backwards and forwards and they, they were very fast, but they had very predictable patterns as well. So you sort of had to choose whether to dodge them or, or throw a crate at them. And there was quite a lot of, I remember, especially on the first level, there was quite a bit of backtracking where you had to go out of your way to go back to get a crate so you could go back to throw it at one of the enemies. But what I remember finding confusing was that if you held a crate and you ran forwards and you hit an enemy, sometimes you'd get hurt, sometimes you'd hit them, and I could never figure out what the connection was. I don't know if it was just random or if there was a particular reason for it, but I remember that the aim of each level was to pick up a certain instrument. And I remember in the first level it was inside the music shop, and you collected these sort of vinyl albums and I just have vivid memories of the, of the first level of sort of going around this building upstairs and around and you grabbed on a balloon to fly up and you had these tanks of water and there was a bit where you went around and there was all these weird series of elevators that went up near the end and again I remember the backtracking with the, the back and forth and you actually did have to sort of like get to the top of the level and I, I'm just describing the first level at this point but I just remember uh, at the top of the level, you had to sort of jump across the clouds, and there was also these birds that came and attacked you. And I did get to the second level, and I'm sure I must have gotten to, like, the third level. I must have. But I don't really remember too much beyond that point. Number 386 is Sonic 3D Flicky's Island. This is a game that came out on the Mega Drive, but I didn't have it on the Mega Drive. I actually first played this game on the, the Sonic Mega Collection that came out on the GameCube with all the other Mega Drive Sonic games. And I think the general consensus of this game is that it's not very good. I do remember when I had a Mega Drive, I was kind of after this game. It wasn't something that I was really, really wanting, but of course, I was at that age where I thought the idea of a 3D game was amazing. So I did kind of have that desire, but I never actually did get it for Mega Drive. So I ended up playing it when I got this this GameCube version of the Mega Collection. And the way that it works is that you have to go around finding the flickies, which are the birds, and then put them into the giant rings as to sort of save them. So you defeat the enemies and the birds come out of them and you pick them up and they follow you. And you can use these to sort of reach higher areas. So say if there's like a life in the air, you can jump on a spring to jump straight up. And if you can't reach it, sometimes if you've got a long trail of flickies behind you, the trail will extend out and hit the life for you. So you can, you can get it that way. And it did seem to be rather slower than a, a regular Sonic game because you weren't just trying to get somewhere, you were trying to search things out, you were trying to search out the enemies and so it was a lot slower in that sort of pro geographical progression type sense. But I still thought it was a decent game. I didn't think this game was terrible, I did think it was a decent game. And I do remember thinking that the music got pretty good and I remember finding it rather interesting like how in the second world where You've got to find the, the platforms that make you spin round so you can break through the ruins so you can create different paths between different areas. I thought that was quite interesting, but it's not a game that ever really stuck with me, so I can't really talk about nostalgia in that regards. It's always nice when I can talk about nostalgia with these games, it's always a nice thing to talk about, but some games I just don't really have that nostalgia. Number 385 is Cuboid. This is a game that was on the PS3. Again, another one of those PS3 down download games. And this is quite interesting because it was quite a, a quite a strange game. It was a puzzle game where you had lots of stages and you had to solve the puzzle on each stage. But the way that it worked was you had this cuboid that was sort of like it was the size and the shape of two cubes, and you had to sort of roll it along. But of course, with it being a cuboid rather than just a cube, its sides actually made a difference to its movement. So you could have it laying flat, and if you wanted to go to the right, it would roll along to the right. But of course, it would keep changing from being on its side to upright, to on its side to upright. So it was very much like... You had to get it standing on this single tile at the end of the level, but you couldn't just move it there. 
you had to sort of rearrange it and fiddle around with it so you could line it up so that you could have it standing up straight on that tile so that you could complete the level. An interesting concept. Next game on the list, number 384, is Castlevania. Now, I actually got this on the Wii, the Wii Virtual Console, and this is a game that, to be honest, I didn't know what it was going to be like, because when I first heard of Castlevania, it was via the internet. I didn't grow up with Castlevania at all. I didn't know anything about Castlevania until the internet came along, and then I learned about Castlevania. But I learned about the Symphony of the Night, type of games before actually getting to grips with the idea of like these uh, these early Castlevania games. So I was kind of under the impression that Castlevania games were just sort of like these 2D platforming style RPGs which I thought was interesting, which is why I got this game to begin with because I thought that's what it might be. Turned out it wasn't, it was just a platform game, uh, but it's very, very much its own unique style. You can tell by playing it that it's not it's not like a Mario or a Sonic or something like that. You can tell by playing it that it's much got it's got a much slower, more methodical, more solid control scheme whereby, you know, you can't change your direction of jumping in midair and there's a slight delay between pressing the button and your attack with the whip and the fact that you can't move when you attack. There's a very sort of heaviness to it and everything has like a weight to it. Which is why this game can get away with having the first level be a flat plane with just enemies popping out with occasional staircases. It's why it can get away with that. And so I kind of had higher expectations of this game because I was thinking of the whole RPG thing. And that's not what I got. But I still did have fun with this game. And I don't think it's as amazing as some people do. But I did have some fun with it. Number 383 is Golden Axe, the original Golden Axe, which I believe I had on the Amiga, but I'm not so sure because I may have had it on the Mega Drive as well, or instead of, not too sure. I think I may have had it on the Mega Drive when it was on one of those collection things like Mega Games or something, and I may have played it that way. I definitely didn't have the cartridge of Golden Axe. But it's one of those, it's a beat em up game, like the old Double Dragon style game. But it's got that mythical dragon style theme to it. And to be honest, playing this now, I find it a lot harder to control than I did then. I find everything's got a really weird feel to it. Like jumping and attacking is very, very powerful for some reason. It doesn't, I don't know, it's hard to describe. Like you jump and attack, it's like if you jump and attack, the enemy will definitely be knocked out. But if you attack them, uh, everything just has this really weird flow to it and the sound effects kind of have this weird sound to it as well. It, it's rather hard to describe in that regards but I do remember playing through it on the later difficulties and getting to the later stages with Death Adder and the different variants of Death Adder and the final stage where there was the statues that came to life and I remember being really hyped about being on the final level and how just how strong I felt of being able to get to this final level, but you don't get that with games now. You don't, you, games today, you don't feel amazing for getting to the end of them. You sort of just don't, which you, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It, games can have all sorts of different emotions and feelings, but that particular feeling, games don't really have that anymore. You don't get that, I'm finally going to ple complete it this run through in modern games. But I do remember, I think one big thing that did stick out to me with this game was that the three characters had different magic powers that they could use when you picked up the when you picked up the different spell bottles. More so than just how they looked, the fact that they had different ranges. So you had one character with only a few ranges, and then you had another character with this huge range, but took a long time to get to the like the second range or the third range these different different stages of power which I remember I always tried my hardest to get to the final stage of the longest path which may not have been a strategically good idea but it's what I did but yeah my strongest and best memories of this game are finally getting to that final stage where the final boss uses that attack where you hit the floor and all the fire things spread out in six different directions and all that okay I'm going to end this here so thank you for listening 
and I will see you next time.